Welcome to an online Bible study from Harborside Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join Pastor Arbuckle for this week's Bible study. If you remember from our study, uh, chapters 3 and 4 are the doctrinal section of, of Galatians. Chapters 1 and 2 were personal. Uh, we looked at Paul's performance prior to his salvation and then after his salvation. We also looked at uh, the performance of Peter and so on. And, um, you, you know, it's just one of those things that people sometimes get caught up in uh, believing that they have to do something in order to get saved. Maybe you talk to somebody during uh, your Christian life and wanted them to wanted to see them saved. And they said, well, you know, I, all I got to do is be good. Well, no, that's not true. And Paul answers some of those questions for us. But I want to continue as he brings several arguments. He actually brings three arguments in chapter three and, and three arguments in chapter four in regard to the, this doctrinal section. We saw last time we, he was talking about the personal uh, speaking to the Galatians personally, the personal argument. Uh, he mentions there in uh, chapter three, uh, in verse one, he calls them foolish Galatians. Uh, he mentions in, in verse number three as well, are you so foolish? Okay. Uh, he asks the question there in verse number three, are, having begun in the spirit, okay, that's when you're saved, all right, uh, are, are you now made perfect or complete by the flesh? And he's talking about their sanctification afterward, okay? The way you got saved is the way you get, you stay saved, okay? By faith, by grace, through faith, and so forth. It's not uh, a work that you have to do and so on. Now, we started last time. Uh, looking at the uh, arguments from Scripture, um, I want us to read um, verses 6 through 14 again, and we'll get into these particular um, presentations, these Old Testament passages that Paul uses. He refers the uh, Galatians to these passages in the Old Testament. Let's read uh, chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse number 6 says, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which, are, which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, I want us to look at the Old Testament passages uh, as we go down through here, as Paul gives them uh, to enforce his point that salvation was by grace through faith without the works of the law. Okay, he begins in verses 6 and 7, where he says, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Where was that? Well, you got to turn all the way back to Genesis, Genesis 15, if you want to turn there. Uh, let's go back there uh, to Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> And let's, actually, let's uh, read, start reading, well, let's just, let's just read verse number six, okay? Genesis 15, six says, and he, speaking of Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, God, counted it to him, Abraham, for righteousness, okay? Um, how was Abraham saved? Was he doing some work? Was he following the law? No. We're going to see here in just a little bit that the law wasn't, you know, several hundred years after this event in Abraham's life that God gave the law. So 
How was Abraham saved? We'll go back to Galatians, hold your finger there, and I'm going to have you turn to Romans chapter 4. All right? Romans chapter 4. Hold your finger in Galatians. We'll come back there, of course. But turn to Romans chapter 4. Notice what he says, what Paul says. He's speaking of Abraham in Romans chapter 4. Verse number one says, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had found? What did Abraham find? Verse number two, for if Abraham were justified by works, okay, if he, his performance was what made him right with the Lord, which saved him and so forth, what does it say there? He hath whereof to glory, but not before God, okay? Okay. He goes on, he said, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. We just read that, Genesis 15, 6, okay? And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of, de of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, so there's a scriptural argument there. There's several there again. We're going to go through this these passages of scripture here, but the scripture is telling us just that as in Abraham, okay, the way Abraham got saved is the way you and I get saved by grace through faith. It's our putting our faith, our dependence, our belief on what God said, okay, for our salvation. Skip down to verse 20 of Romans chapter 4. And look at this. It says, he, speaking of Abraham again, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, okay? God didn't tell us about Abraham just for Abraham's benefit, okay? says um was not now it was not written for his sake alone but it was imputed to that it was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up jesus our lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification why did god mention abraham why did god mention how abraham was saved God mentioned Abraham and the way he was saved for our benefit so we could know how to be saved. It's one of the things that God has graciously given us. Go back to Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse number 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, we'll not take time uh, to go back to Genesis, but Paul is quoting in this, in this passage of Scripture here in, Genesis, or in Galatians, Genesis chapter 12, okay? And verse number three. Um, again, Abraham believed the promise, and his faith was counted for righteousness, okay? It was simple, simple faith. He put his trust, his reliance, his belief on what God said that he, that God would do. He, God made a promise to him, and Abraham believed what God said, and that basically, um, in a very small nutshell, is what salvation is all about. It's simply believing what God has said. Now, um, <clears throat> Verse number 10, we're going to skip down through here. Um, uh, Galatians chapter 3, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth. Now notice this. Continueth not in all things were, which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, Paul uses Deuteronomy, we'll not go back there for, for sake of time, but he mentions Deuteronomy 27 and verse number 26, and it shows that the law, now think about this for just a second. You look at verse 10, 
says, Curses is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Okay, if your faith is based on your performance on doing the law, okay, maybe it is that you've talked to somebody about their salvation and, and they say, well, I'm keeping the Ten Commandments, okay? Maybe you've talked to somebody that has said that. Well, um, that's all well and good. You can try, but how many of us have ever done that? You see, if you, if, if you don't keep every point of the law perfectly all the time, guess what? You have sinned and you're cursed, okay? You're going to be judged and so on. And the law or the Deuteronomy, I should say, 27, as Paul is referring to it here in verse number, number uh, 10 of Galatians chapter 3, he said, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Okay? The law demands perfection. I'm sorry to have to tell you. And a curse was attached to failing to keep any part of it. Okay? You're guilty if you don't keep every part of the law perfectly. Now think about that for just a second. How many of us have ever gone through a day and not sinned? Now, I know there are some people that would say, well, I've, I've done that. I, 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 as a matter of fact, I don't sin anymore. Okay, I have relatives that believe in what they call a second blessed, a second blessing holiness. That after they're saved, after a period of time, after they're saved, there will come a time in this lifetime before they get to heaven where they don't sin. And it's impossible. It is impossible. How many of us can keep such a control of our tongue that we don't say anything unkind through the day or snide or, or sarcastic or whatever it might be? How many of us have such control on our thoughts that we never have a wrong thought? Do you see, beloved, it's impossible for that to happen, okay? And it's one of the reasons why we're studying the book of Galatians, because there are people out there that believe that, one, they get saved by performance, okay? That's not possible. Our salvation is by grace, through faith, without the works of the law. They might say, okay, fine, but just as the, the, the Judaizers, those false teachers that were following Paul and causing problems with the churches in Galatia, okay, they say, and just like the, um, uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement, uh, the 119 Ministries, they believe that in order to, to stay saved, you need to perform the works of the law, in particular, uh, the, the various uh, festivals and feasts and, and that kind of thing uh, that God mentions for the for the Jews in in the Old Testament okay all right in order to stay saved you got to understand something it's not possible for us to keep the law to that degree it's it is impossible okay um, and the law cannot save anybody it can only curse because it says, notice there in verse 10 again, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written to do these things, okay? That's the only thing the law can do is to curse us, all right? So let's go a little further. We're going to get into another argument here in just a, just a few minutes, but uh, verse number 11 he says in Galatians 3, in verse number 11, he says, but that no man is justified, no man is made right with the Lord by the law in the sight of God is evident. Why is that? 
Well, because Habakkuk chapter two, verse number four says, <clears throat> excuse me, the just shall live by faith. Okay. It's mentioned in Habakkuk. It's mentioned here in Galatians chapter three. It's mentioned uh, earlier in one of the uh, Pauline epistles in Romans in particular, chapter one, verse 17. And it's also mentioned in Hebrews chapter 10, the first part of verse 38 mentions this particular idea. Okay. Now answer this question for me. Why would God put that in the Bible four different times? What's the reasoning behind the repetition? Well, you know uh, that repetition helps us understand things, helps us remember things, right? Uh, and that's certainly got to be part of uh, the idea of mentioning it at least four times, okay, uh, to help us realize that the just those that are right with the Lord, okay, how will they live? After they made righteous, made just by their faith, how will they live? They live by faith, okay? He goes on. He mentions another scripture here, verse number 12. And the law is not of faith, okay? It wasn't faith. It was performance. That's what the law was, okay? The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Paul refers way back in the Old Testament to Leviticus 18. Just write it down. You can look at it later. We'll not go into that into, into it to, to turn to it and so forth. Now you've got to understand something. When it comes to um, verse number uh, 12 there, the man that doeth them shall live in them. Okay. Uh, there's a big difference between doing and believing. They're mutually exclusive. Salvation is either by works or it's by faith. It's by believing. You can't have them. You can't have both. Okay. And we know that no man is justified by the works of the law, which means what? which means that salvation, justification, being made righteous, being, being made, uh, our, our, our salvation is based on our faith, simple faith. The basic principle of the law, which is found in Leviticus 18.5, is again, that only perfect performance could win divine approval. Okay, if you're gonna be right with God by living by the law, you're going to have to keep the law. Every jot, every tittle, every 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 T's got to be crossed. Every I's got to be dotted, just perfectly, every minute of every day. And it is impossible to do that. He goes on in verses 13 and 14 in this section. He says, "Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us." For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, Paul is referring back to Deuteronomy 21 and verse 23. And again, he, he reiterates, he emphasizes again, he reminds them once again and repeats this idea that the law puts us under a curse. Okay, you're going to be cursed if you don't keep the law. And it's impossible to, to keep the law. So we're put under a curse. But Christ has come, he says, to redeem us from the curse of the law. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sin and removed that curse because he removed that standard all we have to do in order to be saved is to do what? Do what Abraham did. Abraham believed God. All we have to do is believe. All we have to do is put our faith in what Jesus did on the cross. All we have to do is put our reliance, our, 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 our faith, our belief, on what he did on the cross as payment for our sin. And what happens after that? 
we do the same thing as we live our lives in Christ. We don't have to do anything to stay saved. We don't have to do anything. We can't do anything to be saved. And the Apostle Paul brings these scriptures out. Again, you could take them and, and study them on your own if you want to. We'll not go into a deep dive on them, so to speak. But he uses this scriptural argument, okay? The Bible tells us in a number of places about these principles, about this, this idea that you cannot be saved by keeping the law. You cannot stay saved by keeping the law. Salvation comes by simple faith and living the Christian life and staying saved after you're saved comes by faith as well. Well, let's change gears here a little bit, okay? Um, Isaiah 118, maybe you're familiar with that passage of scripture. It says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, okay? Uh, if, if you've been at Harborside Baptist Church for any period of time, you've probably heard me say on more than one occasion, now think about this, Okay. That's the idea I want us to, to look at because this is another argument, an argument from reasoning, okay, that Paul gives. He sits almost like he's sitting with the Galatians and he's saying, okay, look, let's think about this for just a second, okay? He's already presented what the Bible has to say the various passages of scripture, and I'm sure there are others we don't have time to look into. But he's, he's, Paul puts several thought-provoking statements out there, okay, for them to reason with, to think about, okay? Now, let's start. Let's think about, let's think about a contract, okay? Verse 15, he says, brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's covenant, a man's contract, Yet if it be confirmed, okay, let's just suppose you went to somebody and you worked on you, whatever it is you got together and you said, um, I want us to go into business together. I want to um, sell you something. I want to buy something that you have and, and so on. And um, they go out and they make out a contract, okay? Um, People do that all the time, even today in the in the, the 21st century. Okay. Notice what he says. Yet if it be confirmed, okay, if we filled out all of the requirements, we paid all the fees, we got it notarized, we got it stamped, we got it finalized, whatever it is. Okay. I have a contract right here. What is that? What does that say? No man can disannul that or add to it. Somebody can't, after you have that contract, all that covenant, they call it biblically, okay? You have that taken care of. You have the witnesses. You have them sign it. You have it notarized. Maybe you have a, you know, a, cl a clerk or something like that. Go ahead and notarize it and stamp it and so on and so forth, okay? That's legally binding, okay? Somebody can't come in and afterward and say, oh, by the way, no, I have this contract. Well, what did God give Abraham? God gave Abraham, a, again, the biblical term is covenant. It is an agreement between two parties. It is a contract, okay? And when God gave the contract to Abraham, made the covenant with Abraham that Abraham believed, because and because of his faith, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Okay. Nobody can come in there and say, oh, wait, 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 hang on just a second. That's not right. What I got here zeroes that thing out. What I got here, this works of the law, that does away with this promise that God gave to Abraham. That does away with the covenant that God gave to Abraham. The contract, I got this right here. Okay, wait a minute. What does the Bible say? Though it be a man's key, again, he's using an illustration here, okay? Um, it's a completed contract or a pleaded 
a completed covenant cannot be changed. Look at verse 17. He says that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ with the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, though it should make the promise that it should make the promise of none effect. What is he saying? When did the law come? Hundreds of years after God made this covenant, this contract, this promise with Abraham. You understand that? So as we think about a contract, I've already got it. It's been signed. Both parties have, have agreed to it. It's been witnessed and it's been stamped and it's been legalized and it's been filed. Okay, I've got this thing. Nothing after that is going to change it. That's what he's talking about here. When it comes to salvation, how again was Abraham saved? Abraham was saved by grace through faith, just like you and me. And nothing can change it. But let's think about the law. That covenant that God made with Abraham, which was confirmed in Christ, okay, cannot be changed or nullified by the law because the law came after the covenant was finalized. Does that make sense? It says 430 years afterward, okay, the Abrahamic covenant was reemphasized and restated to Jacob. And 430 years later, what happened? He's talking about, he's referring to the Exodus, that God would give them a land. He did that, okay? But the promise that he made to Abraham was already codified. It was already completed. It was already legalized in a matter of speaking. It was already settled and nothing could change it just like a contract that you would make between yourself and somebody else, whether it be buying a house, buying a car, whatever it might be, okay? Now, let's go on a little further, all right? Wherefore, verse number 19, then service serves the law, okay? The Judaizers might say, and undoubtedly Paul kind of thought this process through, okay? Um, maybe they're going to ask, well, then why did God give the law? Is, is the law nothing? Is the law just something that, you, you know, we should disregard? Okay, wait a minute. Look at verse 19 here. He says, wherefore then serveth the law? Why was the law given? Well, it was added because of transgressions. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that it was the law was given to define sin. All right. Hold your finger in Galatians chapter three and turn to Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. Notice verse 20. Romans 3.20 says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Now, notice, here's the reasoning, okay? For by the law is the knowledge of sin, okay? By the law is the knowledge of sin. Turn a page over or so to chapter 7, Romans chapter 7. And look at verse number seven. Romans 7, 7 says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. The law is not a bad thing, okay? He says, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. What does the law do then? The law defines sin. It's one of the reasons why it was given, okay, to define sin, all right? 
Let's go a little further. Back to Galatians chapter three. Because I want you to think about the law, okay? It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to know, hey, look, if, um, if I go speeding down the road faster than the posted speed limit, I can get pulled over for what? For speeding. How would I know I was speeding? Because the law defines it, okay? Paul uses the illustration in Romans, I would, I would not have known that lust, what is lust? Lust is a desire, okay? It's not necessarily just a desire for sexual things or physical things. It could be a desire to, for fame or fortune or possessions or whatever. Okay, something that I really desire. Okay, and he says, thou shalt not covet. What kind of desire is that? What kind of lust is that? That's a desire, a lust to have something that doesn't belong to me that belongs to somebody else. Okay, and I come to know that because the law did what? The law codified it. Okay, God wrote it down. And he defined it, all right, through the law, all right? Now, it defines sin. Now, let's skip a little further into this chapter, down into this chapter, Galatians chapter 3. He says, is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, okay, if there had been a law that could have given eternal life, that's what he's talking about here, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law, okay? But he goes further and he says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, okay? What is he doing here? What did the law do? It defined sin and it also defined or declared all of us, all mankind, sinful. Why? Because we can't keep the law. We, we break the law. We're sinful. We lust. We whatever it is. We lust. We kill. We you know that all of that, all right. But the law is a good thing because it not only defines sin, but it also declares all of us sinful. You say, Pastor, how in the world can that be a good thing? Let's get one more point here. Look at verse 24, okay? Galatians 3, 24 says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, okay? Was our tutor in a matter of speaking, that strict disciplinarian, okay? To do what? Notice verse 24, it was our schoolmaster to do what? To bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So what does it do? The law defines sin, okay, which is a good thing. It also declares all of us sinful. We can't keep the law because we keep breaking the law. And it directs the sinful toward the Savior, okay? I get to a point where I can't, I can't keep the law anymore. I tried. I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried and I can't do it. I've, I've gone through all of the steps, however many step program it is. And I've tried and I tried and I tried and I tried and I got this lust and I got this desire and I can't, I just can't get over it. And in the case of salvation, I've worked and 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 I've worked, and I've worked but I find out that I'm still as miserable as I was when I started, and I'm no closer to heaven than when I got started. So what do I do? Directs us the sinful toward the Savior to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Let me give you one more verse of scripture. Turn to Acts chapter 13. 
Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. Look at verse 38. This is where the thought starts. Paul is speaking. He and Barnabas are in Antioch. And he says, be it known unto you, therefore, men, Acts 13, 38, and brethren, that through this man, speaking of Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, okay? And by him, verse 39, Acts 13, 39 says, and by him, all that believe are justified from all things. What does that mean? By him, all that believe, all that put their faith in Christ are justified. We're made right with the Lord, okay? We're made righteous. It's just as if I'd never sinned. We're saved. That's what he's talking about. Now, notice this. This is very important. He says, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. There's no possible way that anybody can be saved or stay saved by keeping the law. It's only by putting your faith in Christ on both, both circumstances, both sides of that, okay? And it what does it do again? It defines sin, all right? It declares me a sinner because I can't keep the law. Breaking the law is a sin in any part of it. Declares me to be sinful in order to direct me toward the one who can make me righteous, who can make me justified, who can save me, who can make me right with God. And where? how does that come? It comes simply by believing. It's that childlike, simple faith that Abraham had way back in the Old Testament. You see, the Bible says when God told him to go from Ur of the Chaldees to a land that, he, that God would show him, Abraham immediately went out, not knowing where he went. But what did he do? He just simply trusted and followed the Lord. And God counted that faith, made him righteous, made him have that right relationship with the Lord. Paul is going to continue these arguments in chapter four. I want to it just kind of encourage you to continue to read. If you haven't already, read through the book of Galatians. We'll continue next time as we continue our study, but I want to remind you of this. The law can't save. The law can't keep you saved. It's only by grace through faith that both of those things happen. It's by simple faith that we're saved and simple faith that we follow the Lord and continue to follow the Lord and we're changed into the image of his son. It's not performance, folks, but there are so many, just like the Galatians, who are foolish. Unfortunately, they've been bewitched. They believe they've gone to some church where there was a pastor that said, thus and such and so and so, you got to do this in order to stay saved. You can lose your salvation. It's not what scripture says. It's not what Jesus said in the, in, in, in the gospels. He talked about eternal and everlasting life. By what? He that believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm sure that if, if there had been something other than that, wouldn't Jesus have told Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Surely he would have, but he didn't. All he told Nicodemus was if you put your faith in Christ, if you believe on him, you will have eternal life. That's what it's all about. Unfortunately, there are those that want to be, be imprisoned even after they're saved. That's what our study is all about, escaping the prison of performance. We'll get into it a little further in the Galatians chapter 4 next time. Paul will um, present three more arguments uh, in this particular passage of scripture.
I hope you'll read it. We'll look at it next time. But right now, let's have a, a word of prayer and then we'll take our prayer requests and have our time of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand how simple salvation is. And really, the other side of that, how simple sanctification is as well. Sanctification is, in a matter of speaking, by grace through faith as well. We can't do anything to keep ourselves saved. Your word tells us that we're kept by your power. We're saved by your power as well. We pray that you would help us to understand that. Help us to take these lessons and these messages, Lord, to any that we know that are trying to work their way to heaven or trying to work their way to keep their salvation, that believe that they can lose it. It's not what your word says. It's not what Abraham believed. It's not what Jesus said. Certainly not what Paul has taught us. We pray that you would help us to understand these principles even better than we do now. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.